Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. Seventy years ago, at the end of the Second World War, Germany and the Korean Peninsula were divided. Yet, while Germany has now been reunited for 25 years, Korean reunification remains a distant prospect. Under what conditions could, then, unification happen? What steps are being taken right now to prepare for this possibility? And what lessons can we draw from the German experience of reunification? In order to answer these questions, we had the pleasure of interviewing Dr. Bernhard Zelliger. Dr. Zelliger is since 2002 the resident representative in Seoul of the Hans Seidel Foundation, which is associated with the German conservative party CSU. He is associate editor of the North Korean Review and serves on the editorial advisory board of the Korean Journal of Unification Affairs. Dr. Zelliger received his PhD from the Faculty of Economics and Social Sciences at the Christian Albrechts University in Kiel. His doctoral dissertation was awarded the first prize of the Wolfgang Retter Foundation. Dr. Zellinger, welcome to Korea and the World. Uh, what brought you to Korea in the first place? I came here in 1998 uh, and it was the time when Korea in this wake of globalization uh, established certain new international programs at universities. And one of the universities, there were nine chosen at all and one was the uh, Hangul University of Foreign Studies. And I was invited to teach at the Graduate School of International and Area Studies, as it was called at that time. Uh, European economics and I didn't regret to come and since then ever have been here. Did you have a prior interest in South Korea or in Korean Not at affairs? All. Not I all. remember when I first got the phone call from Korea it was very surprising for me that they chose me and I had no knowledge and I don't remember that in school we ever talked about Korea maybe a passing mentioning of the Korean War but my knowledge was very very scarce at time. And why did you accept the position uh, as a personal challenge or did you see something about Korea? No, it was more a personal uh, interest and uh, a great job which was offered to me teaching there and it was certainly very exciting. But it was a time just after the Asian crisis, 1998, when the financial crisis was still uh, fully to, to feel here in effect and many of my colleagues really strongly advised me against coming here. But I mm. thought, I have nothing to lose, I can come, and if I don't like it, I would leave again. But as I said, I stayed ever since here. So you are the uh, resident representative of the Hans Seidel Foundation here in South Korea. I think it is associated with the Christian Social Union in, in Germany. Can you maybe tell us about the, the structure of the foundation and mm. what, is it, what is its purpose, and obviously what you specifically do here in Seoul? Well, in Germany, after the uh, Second World War, there was some consensus there should be civic education of the population. And it was an American idea, actually, to say this civic education should not be done by the state. Obviously, Germany had very bad experience with state-guided education. And it was in that time also seen in, in East Germany what problems that brought. And so a pluralist system was uh, advice to be installed and uh, Germany decided then to install a system where the political parties which are represented in the parliament can set up these foundations or foundations close to them legally NGOs and they are financed practically entirely by the German government. Our funding now to some extent also comes from the European Union and uh, also we have partners here in Korea were obviously rich enough to fund uh, activities. And when Germany became richer from the 1960s on, these foundations also worked for German development programs. Obviously, South Korea is not a developing country. German Development Aid, which was quite active, left a long time ago here mm. in the early 1990s. But the political foundations, four of them, still stay here in Korea. The reason is North Korea and the division of the country. The interest in German experience of unification is very great. And uh, also there is uh, some hope that uh, German foundations can help a little bit to overcome division. And that's what we try to do with implementing programs in South and North Korea. In the South Korean discourse uh, on unification, the German exa example and the German experience are you know, always referred to. And so the first question I'd like to ask you is, do you think the comparison is valid? And ultimately, is it also a helpful comparison? Well, how many books do you want I write about that? It's a very complex question. Naturally, a comparison is valid to some extent, if you understand it rightly. But it's interesting to see, 
that German unification is here seen from very specific viewpoints which changed over time. We had the early 1990s when there was a euphoria and uh, people thought here, yeah, well, we'll follow the German way, we'll have unification soon. Then there was a phase when difficulties in Germany arose, especially in the economy, in the labor market, when people said we want everything but the German system. And then it was the experience with Ostpolitik, with rapprochement before unification rather, which became interesting. Then it was question of unification financing. And finally now, uh, since uh, this administration of Pakunay, we have really this full-scale interest in German unification, though we might uh, rather argue that the similarities became less over time, maybe. But uh, we have to cope with this, and I think there are some very interesting lessons to learn, actually, from German unification, uh, which we maybe can later mm -hmm. go on more in detail. Looking back at the German experience um, 25 years ago, and I think you touched maybe a bit upon it, how do Germans judge their own reunification? Mm -hmm. Do you think that this legacy has maybe been called into question and could explain, you know, how the South mm. Koreans vary on their view of German unification? Well, one thing which is interesting uh, to see for me, uh, I work in my office with interns from Germany, really how this becomes an issue of history for Germans now. It really fades away and the young people working here with me now, for them unification is a, a given fact and it's unimaginable to live in a divided Germany. But when I grew up, actually I was grew up in the western part of Germany, but came from a, a divided family. And uh, for most uh, of the people in Germany then, it was unimaginable to live in a unified Germany, which uh, is very interesting because in Germany uh, we were rather able to travel. I, For example, in my family I traveled almost every year either to East Berlin or to Eastern Germany. We could talk to our relatives there. We had uh, letters, we had even telephone calls with some difficulty, but nobody had an inkling and an idea that unification might be in the cards. Actually, we were all quite convinced it will never come. Mm. And here it's interesting then to see that for the Koreans, some people have this mantra of unification, uh, which they really hold before them. But on the other hand, there's no context at all. But the German example, and that's one of the things which might be interesting for Korea, shows that at least you should be prepared. It can come, even if you have no idea that it comes, it can come faster than you think. Who are the, the main actors in South Korea who you believe really hold to that mantra of unification and always you know, come back to that issue? Uh, well, it's politicians. Mm. And uh, I would say on both sides of the political spectrum, if I say it a little bit uh, in a funny way, it's, it's, it's a whole industry of unification researchers. And mm -hmm. I, I don't want to de demean it or to degrade it because I really think it's, it's necessary and important to study the possibilities or the scenarios or um, the contingencies of possible uh, unification. But if you think that uh, after German unification, more than 300 Koreans wrote a doctoral dissertation on German unification and how it relates to Korea. You also see, see that similarities only go so far. And uh, we have dissertations on family law, on meteorology, on forestry, on uh, agriculture, on every aspect of life, really. And what sometimes the danger seems to be is that these the German's case is taken and from that, uh, Koreans try to condense a kind of blueprint and say we have to follow this and this step, then we come to unification. This is neither true in the field of foreign relations nor any other field. Korea really has to find its own way for unification. But there is clearly this idea uh, we need to prepare, so that means a plan and best a few steps and then we follow them and then unifications come up. That cannot work. Yeah, there's really this, this feeling... Uh, um that the German experience has completely hijacked the debate on Korean unification. I mean, like, there's a flood of PhD dissertation being written, as you said. Is, it, is that a fair assessment that we're not looking at other examples because of what happened in Germany? On the whole, I would say yes. Naturally, there are always researchers who discuss various issues. We have just uh, a few days ago been in Seoul National University and discussed in a conference among other cases, also the case of cross-trade relations. There is a new book appearing now by a researcher affiliated with the Ministry of Unification, 
dealing with the Irish peace process, which also holds mm. interesting examples for Korea. And there are some other um, debates. As I said, it's a whole industry working on unification, but a little bit in, in the public image, probably also related to the fact that Park Geun-hye has a strong relation to our Chancellor, Angela Merkel, and that uh, Koreans nowadays they even talk about the Merkel project. Uh, it's, it's a project on uh, developing people who come from North Korea here to future yeah. leaders. It's very interesting to see how, how much really in terms of symbolism this is true. And it's true also for uh, all the speeches the president held, starting with Kim De Jong, his Berlin speech, and now ending with the, with the Dresden speech of Park Geun-hye. But we, again, one has to be careful. Only talking about unification doesn't bring it about. And in many cases, even talking too much uh, seems to, for me to be one of the problems we have here in politics, instead of a little more of quiet diplomacy and quiet approaches to, to unification. So Germany cannot be a blueprint, but still, what lessons do you think we can draw from the German experience in terms of preparing for unification and, of course, maybe managing the process when it occurs? Well, one thing I already said, it was unexpected for us, but it, but it came about. So there should be a level of preparedness, though the problems then I hear different and probably even uh, quite quite more grave than in German case if you think of the nuclear problem uh, other weapon mm. systems uh, the level of economic wealth the wealth difference and here we come maybe to the second point if we look at uh, unification in Germany it was driven clearly by the desire of each Germans Koreans often, and I would say this is a big misunderstanding about German unification, speak of the policy of absorption. Though it's true that somehow East Germany was absorbed in the West, it was not a deliberate policy by the West which absorbed them, but it was rather the pressure of the East. And the mm. biggest pressure came from migration. And this time from the opening of the Berlin Wall in November 1989, to three, four months later, more than half a million people left East Germany. And it came to the point when a social minister of the state of North Rhine-Westphalia, a large industrial state in West Germany, um, said uh, jobs for Vessis for the West <laughs> Germans first. It was a very dangerous situation because a few months after the euphoria of opening of the wall, suddenly all these East Germans came, especially the young ones, the well-educated ones, and suddenly there was uh, this debate, can we really accommodate them all? And then uh, the West German government said, knowing that it was an economically not an optimal solution, okay, we need to bring the German West German mark to the East. We have to really to do everything to have a fast, let's say, adjustment in East Germany. And we have to give them a perspective where they stay at home. And that is something, if you think of in any way, a change in North Korea, an opening of the borders or a new economic policy, the simple attraction of different income levels in the same cultural and, and well, historical area in Korea should not be underestimated. And if you see, we have not many uh, people coming from North Korea, these uh, refugees numbering now 30,000, but they have big difficulties to be integrated here in the South. And if we would uh, speak of about 100,000 coming or maybe millions, mm -hmm. would certainly come to a very dangerous situation in South Korea. And then maybe very similar policies should be adopted of raising the income levels in North Korea very, very fast. Though that brought a lot of other problems like deindustrialization, massive unemployment through reevaluation of the currency, etc. Hmm. Do you see any major mistakes that were committed in Germany uh, during the unification phase that Korea should then avoid and luckily, you know, would know of? Well, one thing I already said, uh, it, it was, for, I'm an economist and from the purely economic point of view, for example, this fast currency union was something where economists really scratched in and said that that cannot work. And actually, our uh, one of our appointments, that the, the president of the central bank, put Deutsche Bundesbank, he resigned over this. He said mm. it was not a mistake if you take it in its political context, because it was done to um, uh, come, let's say, to a stable political situation. And and so it there there are decisions possible which are not optimal in an economic sense, but nevertheless necessary. If you look more on the long-term development, I would say what uh, Germans clearly underestimated uh, was really this difference of 
mindsets of East and West. Uh, we were so proud and so surprised that political unification came so fast and that economic unification, despite initial massive problems, worked out quite well. But the mindset of people was the point where we had really longest to work on. Now, the young generation, for them, it's not anymore an issue. A young East and West German, you cannot recognize them anymore if you don't hear listen hear the dialect. Mm. They listen to the same music and read the same books and or don't read mostly the same TV shows or whatever. So it really came together. But for the older generation, it was a problem. If you now try to figure out what could be uh, the case for Korea, where division almost now double the time than the German division. Now we are in the 70th year of division and where it was much more radical in that sense that we have no traveling, that we have no uh, postal communications and that we have no um, uh, South Korean TV which is seen widely in the north, though mm. we have a certain inflow of, let's say, DVDs, etc. Then you could imagine that's even more of a drifting apart of both sides. One issue that will come in the context of the Korean unification is that of transitional justice. Mm -hmm. So the idea that those who have committed crimes in North Korea should at some point be prosecuted. Mm -hmm. Was Germany able to deal with transitional justice in, uh, when it reunified? Uh, if we look, for example, at the secret police of East Germany, how was that managed? And again, do you see some lessons that Korea can draw from this? It's, it's open for debate at this point. It's Germany tried to, to serve justice, especially also on the backdrop of National Socialism, where many people said justice was not served. Mm. The people who were, let's say, judges uh, in the time of the Third Reich, they still in West Germany largely could work afterwards. And the same is true for many other uh, people working in the public sector. But uh, we found it is extremely difficult because our justice system, the rule of law, is not really made to serve this kind of justice, it's it's practically impossible, especially the longer you go back into time. And there was a famous uh, dictum by uh, one of the uh, East German dissidents who said, we wanted justice, but we got the rule of law. And the rule of law is something very fine and very necessary, but simply it cannot really deal with all these cases. And so we have the situation today that on the one hand we have people who feel that too much has been done and that too much focus has been put, especially on the so-called inofficial members of the Stasi, of the Islam secret service. And on the other hand, we have people who complain that in uh, states like Brandenburg, uh, around Berlin, there's still uh, dozens of judges who have mm. been affiliated with the Stasi and now they are judging maybe people who were in former times had to suffer from the regime. So it's very difficult. And the uh, current German finance minister, uh, Schäuble, he once, before unification, he recommended actually to close the archives of Stasi and not open them. And we have, uh, again, uh, other countries we might also learn from, if you think of truth commissions, if you think of the way of South Africa, we have, we have basically the same or similar problems, let's say. There would be actually many ways to deal with this. And, and the bitter maybe um, experience of Germany is that there cannot be absolute justice to all of them if you follow the rule of law. And then you have also to see the political implications of talking about justice today. Certainly, it will be uh, affecting the unification debate in, in North Korea or the way people see the unification. We can also think, uh, wouldn't there be an, another way to approach, first of all, understanding that's also necessary? It's not an answer to your question mm -hmm. in that sense that uh, there's one way we should follow. But what we learn from Germany it certainly will be incomplete and certainly many people will stay disappointed, whatever way we choose for, for serving justice. Last year, the inspector general of the German foreign office was uh, in Seoul, Hans Ulrich Seid. And he actually said that the German uh, unification experience should be at best an inspiration rather than a lesson. Is that is that more or less what you would agree with? Yes, I would mm. agree with it strongly. I mean, that's the, the whole thing we do in, in academics and in think tanks. We look at uh, cases and we compare things. And I think there's still a, a number of 
inspirations Korea could draw from the German case. We didn't talk, for example, until now about the external situation, mm. where uh, there are important differences between Germany and Korea in the case, but where, uh, in fact, uh, some of the differences might really be very interesting for Korea to study. But it cannot be a lesson or a blueprint. Though, in the end, it's a word. I sometimes use the word lesson myself if I talk in a conference, but rightly understood as an inspiration. Where is the difference there between Germany and, and Korea in terms of international background there? Uh, because West mm. Germany obviously had a lot of support. The support which mm. Germany had, I would say, came by through regional integration. Mm. That's one thing which is very important and where I see really a lack and maybe also a um, task for South Korean international politics. South Korea strongly relies on bilateralism, but bilateralism cannot solve certain problems. And it's extremely difficult if you have countries surrounding you like China or Japan with which you have other issues and then at the same time you want to have some supporting your unification. In German case also um, unification was not the dream of the French or the, mm. the British, but through our international integration, or through the firm integration in the European communities that time, we could overcome the reservations of our partners. And the same was then to the East, this long-term policy of detente, uh, rapprochement, and also symbolism and gestures like the famous Willy Brandt gesture mm. in, in Warsaw, and the same was true to the West. At the same time, this uh, comparison only goes so far. The Koreans rightly say we, we have been the victims, first of all, of uh, colonization and then of the division, which was not our wish. But they don't see that they are in, in a way pol uh, politically in a weaker position here. They need their neighbors more than the other way around. They want their neighbors to support unification. And Germany, for example, was very, very lucky that first the French and then also the Polish, with some differences, extended a hand to Germany after the war and said, OK, first let's make a new approach for friendship and then let's talk about difficult things. Hmm. And also in Germany, the very difficult problems like forced labor were solved in the very end after a very long time. Here, sometimes I think the thinking is the other way around. First, we have to remove all problems, then we talk about friendship. That cannot work, understanding. And that is maybe also a problem in relations to uh, North Korea, by the way. Other than Germany, is there another example of reunification that you think could be useful for Korea? And I think it, I'd like to ask this question because if you look at the difference between Germany and, and Korea, Germany was divided by history, whereas Korea was divided by history and by the civil war mm -hmm. to some extent. And so should we look at maybe other countries like Rwanda even or countries that have experienced, you know, this this uh, level of, mm -hmm. of national destruction? Well, as I said, it's always uh, interesting to look at other countries, but I, I wouldn't say any of these countries could be a model for mm -hmm. Korea or so. But certainly it's, it's important to look at what... Uh, reconciliation really means and that is really also one of the big differences of Germany and Korea this bitterness which you can still feel today in both sides of Korea uh, regarding the war and the experience with the other one we sometimes uh, have difficulties to understand why for example South Korea closes down uh, North Korean websites here it, it looks for us not very mature uh, attitude but if you think of this bitterness uh, things become very very different and then you can understand why it is so difficult to come to certain understanding which was in Germany already implicitly given let's focus now on um, unification efforts in South Korea South Korea has a government ministry of unification dedicated 24-7 to the issue. And so the question I would like to ask you is, what does this ministry actually do? What are they working on right now at the moment? There are certain tasks the ministry has, like they run to some extent the Kaesong Industrial Complex from the South Korean side. This ministry was the most important ministry under the former government, that of uh, Noh Mo-hyun. It was one of really the, the centers of policy making. That's uh, also, if we compared to Germany, a very big difference. We had a ministry, but it was only a ministry in name, or what, as we say in Germany, for Sunday speeches, so for speeches which didn't really carry any um, important political uh, meaning for, for actual policies. And here it's now the case too. And I think one reason is that one saw that under the Numo Hyun government, we had these conflicts of the unification ministry and foreign ministry. 
which were not very conducive to consistent policy. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I think to have a unification ministry, it's also a political, well, declaration of standpoint, namely of the standpoint that unification is still a policy which is important. And in that sense, um, the ministry carries out its tasks. Yeah, maybe it's uh, good to have this ministry. But uh, sometimes I feel... Uh, the more active ministry could also be helpful for unification. What are the steps that are being taken by the South Korean government at the moment in terms of uh, reunification? Uh, and of course, I'm talking here specifically about the trust politic. Mm. Um, what is your what is your take on that? Well, the trust politic is basically a good idea, and it, it refers to what we talked about earlier to regain international trust, especially as that I understand it. But the uh, South Korean government really has this problem that it tries to adhere to principle at the same time and to be flexible. It didn't work out really well until now, to say it openly. And I think the main problem of that is that in Korea, every single contact between North and South is decided on the highest political level in both states. And that is something and more maybe even here in South Korea than in in the North. And that is something which is a stark difference to the German case, where we had a large area of policies or a growing area, let's say, over the uh, late 60s to 70s and 80s, which was depoliticized. And that was, for example, family meetings, also economic context. In Germany, we had this famous uh, Leipzig trade fair in East Germany, where uh, economic leaders and also political leaders met. And even when the political situation was very tense, like in the early 1980s, that never put into question economic cooperation, not to speak of family relations. Nobody ever would have mm. uh, thought to, to regulate, let's say, this family regulation, at least in the West, according to a political uh, situation. And I think that would be a task which in Korea would be really necessary to carry out and here I really refer to South Korea because mm. they have to take the initiative on that to say okay we have political differences and we have standpoints which are very important but uh, we should also allow contacts and not everybody who meets a North Korean is a North Korean spy and so we have to allow first of all we have to give the really the opportunity to increase human contacts, economic contacts. And then we can uh, say later, if there are security concerns, this or that, well, we should act on that. But not like here really to say every single um, contact has to be decided on the highest level. I think that is one uh, problem which really hampers the government in its efforts to create trust between the two Koreas. I have sometimes a feeling the government waits for trust to come from somewhere and then they say, then we are able to act and willing to act. It's not the willingness. They are willing to do uh, activities with North Korea, but they first wait for the trust. But the trust mm. only can come from interaction. That makes the policy more fuzzy or more dirty. And it's, it's a uh, catch-22 somewhere. Yes, yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and if you want really to, to create context, you have to talk to the people. There. It's the same for us as an um, international NGO dealing with North Korea. We deal naturally not with simple people or simple farmers, but we deal with people which we meet there, which are officials of the North Korean government. That is a decision you have to make then. And that includes then uh, a certain, let's say, compromise on principles. And you have to see how far you go. But uh, if you would depoliticize a certain part of the context, it would, would be much easier. And that could create the trust, which then would lead to political dynamics. President Park loves to talk about uni unification bonanza. Um, what do you understand uh, behind that, that concept? And is it true that it would be a, a bonanza? I'm uh, not coming from an English-speaking country. In Germany, we tried to translate this bonanza into it's a lucky case, Glücksfall in Germany, which mm. sounds much better and which is certainly true. If you think of the dollar sign in your eyes, it's not a bonanza. It will be very, very difficult to carry out unification. It's necessary and it's possible. And I'm especially I'm really have a great trust in the, in the ingenuity of the Korean people. Uh, they can do many things and they could overcome many crises. They can do unification, but it will not simply be a bonanza. On the other hand, and here again, the Koreans like to refer to the German case after 25 years of unification. 
and many difficulties which were overcome, Germany managed quite well. And it's clear there are some uh, good points. There is this peace dividend. If you think of this wasteful uh, amount of, of weaponry and mm. of uh, human resources, we have this standoff on the Korean Peninsula. You can think about certain advantages, but you should not expect that you unification itself from the beginning makes Korea richer. There are also some other nice things if you think of demographics. North and South would probably feel uh, together very well, but the first years especially will be uh, of a tremendous difficulty. Let's maybe talk now about the uh, Hans Seidel Foundation. What are you adding to the discourse? What's the what's the added value? Where do you somehow try to accompany the South Korean discourse mm -hmm. on uh, reunification? Well, we work with uh, NGOs, with mm. academic institutions, with governmental institutions. We bring every year, I would say, around 10 delegations to Germany from very different fields. Last year we had a group of journalists coming with us and a South Korean NGO partner. We have a cooperation with Gyeonggi province and bring every year a few dozen uh, officials from Gyeonggi province to Germany. Koreans say seeing is believing, so for them it's very important to see it. The other point is that we try also to bring key persons from Germany here. And these persons can be very different. It can be actors or former actors of the unification process, which becomes, by the way, increasingly difficult over time. We have also people who, let's say, are experts on what we call the management of division. And that's maybe actually in the moment also a field where more can be learned from the German case and at the same time implemented already, because it is still a time of uh, division for Korea. We can talk a lot about privatization or what would happen after opening, but in the moment Korea has to manage the division of both countries. So we also try to bring those experts and we hope to have, make a small contribution through that to uh, unification discourse here. Uh, I have colleagues from other uh, political foundations from Germany who do the same, and I hope we... Um, quite well supplement each other, also with these different points of views. Also to show that the German unification itself was also not a case where there was one blueprint, one very clear-cut case for this or that policy, but it was also a discursive policy. Moving now to uh, North Korea, you had the opportunity to travel to North Korea um, quite often in the last years. What did you perceive there? How do North Koreans view reunification and under what terms would, would they consider it? Uh, I have to say that in North Korea we rarely talk about unification. The topic comes up. It's, in, in a way, the North Koreans, even more than the South Koreans, have this slogans and this mantra of unification. But it's actually, for them, neither an immediate uh, concern, nor is it an area they would like to discuss with foreigners, because they have these three principles on unification, which, which Kim Il-sung set up, and one of them being that it's unification by ourselves, so foreigners mm. are not really expected to be there. But sometimes it comes up, and then the North Koreans usually say, oh, we, uh, our desire is unification, but not the German way. This always follows, to make it very clear that the German way of unification is perceived as a threat to them. And if I again compare it to the situation in Germany, uh, we had in East Germany originally also a unification policy and uh, the idea of unification and even the East German national anthem uh, had this famous line where it said uh, Germany united uh, fatherland. But from the late 1960s on when East Germany found out they couldn't really, let's say, win the systemic competition, it became mm. less and less. And then one day, in I think in 1972, they said... Um, no, we, uh, we have two nations now, West German capitalist, militaristic, revanchist nation and the East German socialist nation. And I think to some extent we are in a similar phase now in Korea because North Korea also says, well, we have the South, which is tainted. Sometimes even there's this mentioning of racial mixture, mm. but more even this, let's say, moral decay, which you see in the South crime and all these foreigners coming in. And then we have the pure socialist nation in the north. They don't yet say there's no way of unification, but they became much more skeptical, let's say, on, on, on this. But as I said, they usually don't discuss it with us. So it seems that the, the, the crux of the dispute here between the two Koreas is that the South wants absorption, to some extent the German way, um, but the North wants anything but absorption. So at some point, 
how do you bring those these two sides together? Well, I'm not so sure. I mean, hmm. If the South really wants absorption, actually, I don't know if you followed the discussion last month when it came out that this preparation committee of the president studied, among many other cases, also the possibility of a North Korean collapse. There was an outcry in the media here and saying, oh, they follow this policy of absorption. And the government was very fast to say, we don't want this anymore. Though, as I said before, I don't think that this is the right understanding of the German case. But this policy of absorption certainly is for the North no option. And it relates also to the deep bitterness of the Korean War, because in Germany, if you look, for example, at the army in East Germany, the NVA, um, nobody was really scared of unification and saying unification will mean maybe we lose our freedom or our life. On the contrary, the army, like any other person, could rather expect uh, the, the officers of the army or so that probably after unification they would be end up richer and better off mm -hmm. than afterwards. But here, I really see that as a big problem that we have this military conflict and this question what happens with the leadership, which means that discussions between both sides, trustful discussions, are much, much more difficult. Do you have the feeling that North Korea or the North Korean government is also preparing for unification just like the South is doing? Do they have the equivalent of a ministry of unification? They have this East Asia Peace Committee, but I don't think they prepare for unification. As I said, they rather move away from it. And one thing which I know North Koreans did was that they a number of times told to their functionaries of the government if we follow the European way, the East European way of transition and unification, look at what happened to Erich Honecker, the former leader of East Germany, he ended mm. in exile, or a leader like Ceausescu, who was even shot. So that is definitely not an option for North Korea. And in that sense, also, you can understand more the slogan of this strong country uh, now is in, in the Byongjin version, but to say we, we need a strong army plus a strong economy, uh, rather as an afterthought. But strong army is really still the basis of, uh, let's say, of, of, of their uh, confidence. So the Hans Seidel Foundation is active in North Korea uh, since 2003. What kind of activities are you engaging uh, in, in North Korea? Uh, we do training programs with our North Korean partners. And uh, over time, these training programs had different uh, focus, but we are um, strongly focusing on green project that is afforestation, which is a, a major challenge for North Korea and a challenge which has been recognized as well in North as in South Korea as an importance and which is related also to much of the problems we see, for example, in agriculture. Another one is climate related activities. We uh, went with our partners here through the process of registering projects of the clean development mechanism of the United Nations and uh, environmental policy related issues. What kind of relationship does the foundation have with the North Korean government? And by that I mean, are you welcome as a you know, external civil society actor or do they sometimes see you as potentially subversive? How do you deal with that? There is, I would say, there are ups and downs in the relationship, as there are also for other organizations. Mm -hmm. And on the one hand, North Korea welcomes international engagement to a certain point. And they invite us to do this or that. But then there's also many uh, places which are closed or many potential programs we offer them which are closed. But we think that training programs are something which uh, Koreans really want to do and also which they understand very well and it, they, there I see a very big similarity still in Koreans north and south of the border training is very important and education is something they want to achieve and so educational programs are one way we hope also to transport by that trust because we think trust can really be only built if you interact and we hope to uh, transfer knowledge valuable knowledge for development but with this also trust dr zellinger you've been in korea now for over 15 years how did the discourse on unification change over time and do you feel that it changed also as generations changed both in no south and north korea i would say uh, here in south korea the last couple of years saw really a revaluation 
of the German case to an extent which sometimes make me even worrying about it. It's very nice to hear, uh, for a German to hear nice words about our policy and how it all worked well, but I see uh, that sometimes really uh, problems are overlooked or are simplified a little bit. And also this expectation that an emulation of this process is possible. It's probably a thing where we have really to be very careful to approach this as an inspiration, not as a blueprint to follow. And clearly, this revaluation came also in Germany itself. I mean, we had our doubts ourselves in the late 1990s. Germany was the the red light uh, of Europe, the lowest growth rate, high unemployment, the sick man of Europe. We have economists, I, I read these publications of fellow economists, and it was the case. And then after reforms, Germany came up again if you can all uh, relate this to unification so simply I, d I doubt it very much problems existed uh, in the economy in germany before unification some of them were strongly increased by unification or some challenges let's say and it took 25 years to overcome them that was good and i think um, we should really talk to our partners here to make it clear that uh, also for korea it's a uh, bonanza it doesn't mean that uh, unification immediately uh, is helpful for your economy but in the first place you have very uh, strong costs to rehabilitate the, the north korean economy if you have the chance to do so if you look at the political discourse i think what i like in the last years is that korea sees how important and i, I refer to south korea here how important international support for unification is Though it stops at that, we are not yet in a point where we can say uh, Korea really acts decisively on that. Maybe some more could be done there. Unification, do you think it is feasible or do you think we're moving slowly to what could amount to a utopia? Because after all, as you mentioned, 70 years have passed, the ties have maybe loosened and would maybe a two-state solution be the best solution? I think the the future is really open there, but I'm quite sure that Koreans still, despite all the difficulties unification also will bring, are, are feeling they are one. And, and that is a point which is probably much stronger in the north than in the south. Very often this debate is uh, referring to young Koreans and young South Koreans who are not interested in unification anymore. It's quite uh, simple and it's quite easy to explain that somebody who lives in Busan or in, in Tegu or in Kwangju today doesn't think about unification because he had no contact. But when it comes this opportunity, I'm sure they will also take up the challenge, let's say, like West Germans living in Freiburg also hmm. didn't think their life, whole life about unification, but when it came, it was accepted by all Germans with the difficulties which were there. But in the end, I think today in Germany, nobody, as I said, can imagine anymore a divided Germany. And I think similar in Korea, though it, it might sound sometimes like a utopia, in the end, I'm quite sure unification will come. It feels that in South Korea, a lot of people are scared of unification because of the gigantic cost. And you did mention the costs, uh, the burden for, for West Germany in the, in the German case, but the economic discrepancy between East Germany and West Germany was way smaller than what we see here in the peninsula. And is economics maybe the explanation as to why we cannot have a unification here in Korea? I think it's an explanation why there is a certain reluctance mm. to accept unification or to think about it more strongly. But I don't think it's a, it's a valid argument against the unification because the costs, they are related to a failed economic system and to the necessity to build up new economic system, some point which even to a large extent has been accepted by, by North Korea now, by its new economic policies, which are to a large extent market-based, though the, how the market works is um, another matter. Uh, so in, in that sense, these costs are, would anyway be there. I think they are not a reason to put off unification of the agenda. Maybe one last question. Do you see reunification happening in your lifetime? What's your take on that? It's my hope to see it while I'm still in Korea. But when it comes, it's really uh, impossible to say. In, in the German case, uh, I remember my father telling me, um, probably it will not be in my lifetime anymore. 
it it came simply it came and and we were lucky to have it there koreans are already better prepared the south koreans in a way with all their preparations they shouldn't expect that this preparation gives them an easy blueprint but then i think they really can deal with it also i'm confident there dr zellinger thank you so much for being our guest today thank you this was korea and the world To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.